Welcome to the co-founders meetup. My name is Raquel and I'm a volunteer. I want to thank Capital Factory for having letting us uh, for sponsoring us and letting us use their facilities here to, to run the, the meetup tonight. Um, let's see some logistics here. More volume? Uh, I think I think we're okay right now. I'll turn it up regardless. Okay, so restrooms. If you guys need the restrooms, they're back. The double doors that you came in when you first entered this area, if you just go straight, the men's are to the left and the women's are to the right. So feel free to step out if you have to go to the restroom. Um, also, our format for tonight will be, um, so we have pitches and we have reverse pitches. We don't have any reverse pitches tonight, but pitches will be four minutes or so. Uh, we will allow people to ask questions after the pitch. So please, please do ask questions. Don't be embarrassed or shy. And then if you feel like you didn't have a chance to ask a question, we do ask the people that are presenting to, when they're done with their presentations and when we cut you off for questions, we ask that the presenters go to the lobby area so that anyone that wants to ask any additional questions can go back there and follow you and, and ask more questions. And for the presenters, Harmon here will be give, giving you the time, so please keep an eye on him. He will be letting you know when your time is nearly up. So just watch him closely, and he will cut you off when we need to be cut off. Um, we had uh, the 2,000 member sign up. So that member, is anybody curious who the 2,000th member was? Sure. His name is Eduardo Contreras. Oh, that's nice. So if you're here, <laughs> you're the 2,000th member to sign up. So congratulations, we don't have any door prizes for you or anything, but just just recognition in this large room of people, so congrats on that honor, I guess. Yeah. So tonight we're going to have 10 presentations as usual, and we'll get started with uh, NetGend, that's with Jim. So feel free to come on up here and we'll turn it over to you. Oh, hold on a second. Just <laughs> It doesn't come against me, does it? No. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> no, it doesn't count against you. So I can press the button to go down? Yeah, you just press the button. Okay. Uh -huh. Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good uh, uh, snack. Uh, my name is Jim, and uh, uh, I'm going to give a talk on this, you know, uh, uh, next generation uh, web application performance test platform. I'm the uh, CTO of NetGen. So um, before I talk about my platform, I'd like to give you some perspective which are the challenges in the uh, performance testing. We know that performance testing is not very sexy, but it's very important. If your website uh, works fine, nobody probably make a noise, but if your uh, website crash or become very slow, everybody would know that, right? Um, so what is the trend in the performance testing area? There, uh, the web applications are getting more and more complex. They need to handle more and more users. And you know, we have those e-commerce sites and social networking sites. And uh, as a result, testing platforms need to be, number one, easy to use. You should not make simple things hard or should not require a lot of programming background on the part of the user. I'm going to give you an example to show that uh, if a test platform makes something as simple as A equals B plus C very complex to do, you can imagine it will be very hard to use it to, to implement a test scenario. And uh, number two, uh, needs to be more scalable. Uh, you should be able to emulate a large number of virtual clients and the more flexible, meaning, meaning that it will need to be able to emulate a lot of clients <coughs> in different applications. Okay, so a uh, NetGen test platform. So it's built on a patent pending technology that solved a long standing problem. Are you going to give me a signal? Oh, yeah. oh, signal okay. Okay. Uh, so to give you a perspective on the on the long standing, there are a lot of players in this market. You know, literally, we're talking about two dozens of test platforms here. And for years, 
nobody could come up with a platform that is easy to use, scalable, and flexible. And after long research, we come up with something that is scalable, meaning that we can emulate 550,000 virtual clients on one system. That is assuming you are doing HTTPS. If you're doing only HTTP clients, we can do a million virtual clients on one box. And we just had a, our block recently. And uh, flexible, we can do very complex parameterization and correlation to emulate different client behavior and easy to use. So it's so easy to use that you don't need to have a lot of programming background. And finally, it runs on cloud and runs on hardware. So uh, you can see that, you know, the little hardware over there, this little box which you can hold on your hand, you don't have enough power to strike down a big server or server farm because of the, uh, that uh, technology. So some highlights. Uh, this is built on JavaScript syntax, so everybody is familiar with that. Very, very common. And uh, what makes it easy is we use a synchronous mode. You know, what makes JavaScript programming hard is because it uses asynchronous programming with a lot of callbacks, especially when you're emulating a complex test scenarios with a lot of steps. You know, this level of complexity is so, uh, so hard, even hard for the experienced programmers. So we made it simple because our human mind is kind of, we can understand sequential things, right? You send a message, you wait for something, when it shows up, you, you process it, you do the next step, but uh, we take care of everything in the background, so we make it you know, asynchronous in the background, but when you write script, you write it in synchronous mode. That's what makes it simple, and it's easy to process complex JSON XML message. You'll be shocked at how easy it is, on the other test platform, you will have to use a regular expression, which is number one, error prone. In extra space, you will throw you off. And also, okay, and finally, uh, you know, finally we mentioned that A equals B plus C is easy because the other platforms made it so hard that you have to extract, you know, use APIs to extract the values from B and C and do operation and use API to write it back. So we made it very simple. So uh, that's it for my talk, and here's my contact information. I'm here to, you know, I'm looking for someone who's good at UI to keep make my application a little shiny. That's it. Thank you very much. All right. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Oh, who are you targeting in terms of your customers right now, and how are you how are you getting? Uh, we're targeting all the, uh, you know, the, the websites, e-commerce, the social networking sites, all the mobile apps, you know, which involves, you know, a, a big server, right? If you have a million downloads and you want to make sure that when so many people download your apps and they are all connected, your sites wouldn't go down or become slow. So all those sites, uh, sites, websites, or uh, e as a, uh, software as a service. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're writing a lot of text, uh, blocks to, to uh, get customers. We have written our 50s a block yesterday. How big is your team currently? And where are you in terms of the revenue or any forms of traction? Uh, we just started to get a little bit, you know, we get some, we have customers who ask me to send emails. So we are waiting for our first dollar right now. Uh, we're, we're getting some uh, business partner here. So uh, we're looking for some UI developer that could help us to make our UI look, look a little more or professional. But we're looking for someone, you know, who, like, who want to try this out, you know, to find out whether their sites is going to have the right capacity they expect. Like, please let me know. So I have to so work with you. You're also looking for beta testers? Yes, beta testers. Yeah, Thank you. Is it based on an ARM risk prep, or is it based on the like, say, six prep? Oh, it's x86, x uh, but the software essentially can run on all the Linux-based platforms. Yeah. So it's, it's written on Linux. It's written on Windows or written on Linux? Uh, on Linux. But we expect to, you know, offer it as a cloud service versus also a hardware, like, you know, a, a mini PC that you can have on your hand. So. Like this. Yeah, um, yeah, but it's a little bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello?
There isn't right now. Okay. You would just right. have to use I'll good old-fashioned up, up and here. down arrows, but I think we got disconnected here. Hello? Testing. Testing. Oh. Nothing like connecting and disconnecting, or disconnecting and connecting. Okay, next up is, um, I guess you're David, mm -hmm. and he is with My Service Wizard. So, here you go. All right. And thank you to the TechMap team and Austin co founders for letting me present tonight. Uh, we'll see if my voice makes it. My voice is disappearing today, so I'll try to get through it for four more minutes. Please stay with me here. I am seeking a co founder for My Service Wizard. And my service wizard offers an online marketplace for repair, helping people through the repair replace decisions to extend the life of their devices, electronics and appliances. So when you think online marketplace, you see prices from local repair vendors. When you think the decision, we give you transparency that is not there today in an asymmetric environment. And we reduce hassle and cost. We're taking you on a short path to the repair solution that's right for you. Can y'all hear me back there? I need to hold it. Okay, all right, I'll do that. So it, all in all, it extends the life <coughs> of your devices, your electronics and appliances in the consumer world. Okay, so how does it work today? And I'm gonna, thought I had a remote here. So this fellow's watching TV, TV breaks, what does he do? He goes to the store, calls the store, the store tells him, go pound sand because we don't fix your TV. So he calls the manufacturer, doesn't get a response. What does he do? He goes to the web and then he finds all these options. <coughs> Buy a new TV, unknown repair time, lots and lots of options. Nothing is clear. It's a horrible decision to make, big hassle. So at this point, trying to decide what do I do with this? Do I repair it? Do I replace it? Do I spend more money? What is the option here? The information is really not out there at all. So there is a better way. And that is giving the consumer the options up front. So when they scan their barcode on the TV or they take a picture of the model number, they can see what those repair options are. Give them the prices of repair vendors who are there locally, and in the cases of phones, some, some may be remote repairs that they can send their phones off to. But the point is to bring the information to the consumer. It's not there today. And also, by the boss sound again, let me see if I can. Disconnect and connect it. That was the only way that I could get it to work. Best. Okay. Well, let me see if I can shout. Can y'all hear me back there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, essentially, the idea is to arm them with the information on whether to repair or replace something or to break. That information is not there today. So, join me. I'm looking for a co-founder who has sales and marketing experience, particularly in channel fights. We're at the point where we need to validate this model through multiple channels. We know that the end user is a consumer, and we are looking for the best means to get to that consumer market. It could be a home builder. Could be a retailer. Uh, we're talking to a lot of a lot of apartment managers today, so we're looking for somebody with this experience, this type of experience. Okay, and also uh, we would love to have somebody who has a passion for the consumer, the little guy. Okay, I passed up the slide that said something about me, but essentially I'm a longtime Dell guy. I was in support at Dell for quite some time, so I have a lot of experience in support. I'm also a past software developer. Okay. Um, so sometimes in software development, it's a little bit rusty there. But that's uh, that's my service wizard. And I, if you're interested, please come contact me. Questions? Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, where are you getting the data for local repair costs? If it's coming from the repair vendors themselves. So they subscribe to this service to list them. So you, you have the subscribers already? We have some subscribers. Yes, sir. So are you scan, are, how are you converting the data that comes to the consumer to give you to give them for you? Can they get a scan and they can take a picture? 
Yeah, some of this is to be developed. Today, it's very basic. When you essentially provide us all the information that's in your unit, so we break that down and we uh, we provide that data back to you after doing some research. So it's it's very basic today, but the point is, over time, it will scale with with better technology. Yes. Going to the market Yes, um, it depends on where the first we land the first customer. Frankly, uh, we're not, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Dishwasher, home appliances. This is ideal for a home appliance. Something breaks. You don't know if it's a warranty or not. We'll be able to tell you that. Yes. Good question. In some cases, you do know what the ultimate price will be in some cases you don't we provide them the price either way if it's a flat fee we'll give them a flat fee if it's a diagnostic fee then they get a diagnostic fee but at least they know in the case where it's a diagnostic fee they know the best option to go to it may be somebody around the corner please be sure to repeat the question okay right. yeah the, the question was what do you do if um the, it's not a flat fee if they, all they offer is a diagnostic fee Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah, that hits the name. My service was. But yeah, the question was: Will it become intelligent over time? Will it be able to detect problems and get smarter about what the right diagnostics are? And the answer is yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is primarily a threat to manufacturers. So this is probably a dead end with most of those. Um, it, with some who are more open-minded about it, absolutely. But um, for most, they are they're protecting a lot of that data today. So the, the opportunities uh, outside the manufacturing realm more with the uh, retailer. Yes. Are you like, um, are you going to connect them to somebody to repair or do you yes. have a team that's repairing? Oh, we, we will not manage a team that's repairing. We'll, we're, we're connected. Okay. Yes? So what do you consider in your primary revenue stream? The re primary revenue stream is from the repair partners themselves. So they use a subscription service, but then in turn, they'll be able to advertise to It's really important though that we, be, we are objective for an objective source to the end user, and that's, that's the idea. It's not like um, some others that are out there where it's more, the more you advertise, the more we'll, we'll promote you. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, next up is, and I hope I don't mispronounce this, Home Nitty. Will? Is that correct? Home Nitty. Home Nitty. It's very much that. I guess I gotta work on the name first. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Will Mitchell, and I'm here with Home Nitty. I am a licensed contractor, having renovated over 550 homes have a degree in architecture and structural engineering from the University of Virginia, and um, who's currently pursuing an MBA at McCombs. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about home renovation. As most of you guys know, home re renovation is a huge industry. $278 billion, up to projected to $350 billion this year. What you may not know is that most homeowners walk away from their home renovation project disappointed, frustrated. They're disappointed that their contractor didn't show up, they finished three months late, that it cost them $10,000 more than they wanted it to. And all the resources out there aren't solving this problem. I mean, you've got Angie's List, Home Advisor, Red Beacon. They're helping you find a contractor. They might be helping you kind of get a good price, but nobody's helping you really get a good product. So what many is aiming to do is help on the homeowners understand not only the cost of their decisions, but also the time impacts and the long-term values that they may see whether or not you want to put the tile diagonal or straight, and how that affects what the project is going to cost you. So really walk you through the project from beginning to the end in a TurboTax kind of fashion so you understand how each one of your decisions impacts the whole project. 
and then slowly benefit, you know, grow that to be a network of a brand on a national basis that it can help facilitate the transaction between the homeowner and the contractor by aggregating the data on thousands of projects so that we can better predict what the cost is actually going to be, what the risks are involved, and have the assurances that the project's going to get done on time and the insurance that it's going to last for a long time. So as I mentioned, I'm a guy with a lot of experience in construction, don't know much about IT at all. So I'm looking for some help on that side. Got a guy helping me, director of UE UI, but looking for some people to come help um, build the technology, build the infrastructure, try to outsource it, don't suggest it. And uh, you'll be able to just like some help. So thank you, I probably finished way too quickly. But <laughs> hopefully it was concise. <laughs> Questions. Questions. Yes, in the back. So, what, what's your primary revenue? So, initially, the revenue stream is through referrals through Commission Junction. Um, long term, it's the facilitating the transaction between the homeowner and the contractor, adding additional services to facilitate, um, you know, aggregating insurance and stuff other other things. Is there a website live right now? The website is not live right now. I mean, homemade.com has something up on it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Right <laughs> uh, customer acquisition is um, primarily looking through referrals through blogs, social media, and search engine optimization, which I know is a bland answer, but that's where I have to go. No, no cost to the homeowner. It's free kind of gamification of the process. You can go through and kind of play around with it, see how each one of the steps and one of the niches that we're going across initially is going after the do-it-yourself contractor. So if you look at the last slide, I'll get the pictures, I'll go back. Um, you can see that you can compare the contractor costs next to the do-it-yourself costs so that the homeowner can have an understanding of whether or not it's really worth their time to take on the project themselves or contract out and try to take advantage of that kind of niche out there right now. You've obviously got a lot of experience yourself after more than 500 homes, but you're going to be in a much broader uh, database to draw on being the building's kind of type of you have access to, the, to enough experiential data to be able to do that well. Yeah, so there's some other companies out there that are kind of already aggregated the data on a national basis that I can tap into and utilize to kind of do it initially, but then it's designed to get feedback as it grows and you know continue to regress the variables against the constants to be able to make sure that we can predict it not only for the zip code, but also the age of the home. Um, how, are you competing with Angie's List? And the question is, am I competing with Angie's List? No, Angie's List pays you to subscribe to their process so you can find a contractor just as if you went to Yelp or Yellow Pages or something else. Um, sorry, that's kind of a little bit of a piece of play, but, um, We're really trying to help you understand what's going to happen. So, contractor walks into your house and asks you, do you want, you know, semi-gloss paint? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> and you're like, well, yeah, you want semi gloss paint. Well, why do you want semi gloss paint? So we really try to give you all the information so you really understand what that implication is, not only to the cost of the project, the time of the project, but also the long time value that it's going to provide to you. So the question is the revenue stream. Um, initially, at the end of the workflow process, we're going to give you a budget for your project. And we're going to ask if you want to find a contractor, if you want to buy the materials. If you click on find a contractor, I get a referral for that and get a commission. If you put buy the materials, I get a cut of what you pay for the materials. Long term, though, we're going to have you actually be able to contract for that value. So if it says it's going to be $5,000 for your zip code, and I can have people in that area you can contract for that price execute the contract right online, and they'll have somebody show up your door and get it done for you. <clears throat> and take a cut of that transaction. Are you going to use virtual reality 3D graphics in order to get the <laughs> You know, the MVP doesn't have that in it, unfortunately. <laughs> but yes, the hope is that we can be able to build some more of those kind of gamification features into it long term, so you really have the kind of viewpoint. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> like a, a viewpoint of like, okay, yeah, I want a bathtub in there and a bathtub shows up. Yeah. yeah. I'm, like, I'm excited about that, but <laughs> don't have it. Exactly, exactly.
More questions? Yeah, ladies first. Hey, have you thought about um, like a white label option for this? Can you explain that to me? So, like a white label is uh, one idea that comes to mind is I'm a, I'm a realtor. And, yep. You know, maybe on my site I can have a, a part of this and not the entire thing. Where if I have someone that's looking at a house and they feel like they're going to have to remodel it, they don't like that cost, they can go in and run through your wizard. Yeah. Yeah. So an embedded widget is uh, I guess I don't know white label, white label. I don't know what that is. But uh, <laughs> yes, an embedded widget. Can we put this embed this widget on some other sites? Yes. The idea is that that would be able to embed it and get some license and other fees off of that if um, it's something that people want to embed. It. <laughs> 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 I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, sorry, you had a question. Um, are, you, are you going to provide a, a marketplace, of course? You know, once you generate a certain estimate, are you going to go and look at ads and various contractors to provide a marketplace to use? So the question is whether or not we're going to provide a marketplace of quotes. The answer is no. The idea is that you're buying home entity, you're not buying some individual contractor and picking them specifically. So if that guy falls down, gets hurt, you got somebody else showing up the next day taking on your project for you. You're not buying one person, you're buying one quality, one brand, one thing. So it's similar to Trulia, if you know it, you only put your information, you get the car, you're guaranteed the car, we're guaranteeing the project. The question is, the question is, the question is why do renovation projects fail and who takes the heat for it? Um, I think a lot of the reason the home renovation projects fail is because there's a lack of communication between the homeowners and the contractors. Do the difficulty in educating the contractor, <laughs> due, due, due to the difficulty in educating the homeowner about the intricacies of the project, and partially a lack of communication abilities on a lot of the contractors out there. We hope to fix that by these workflow calculators that help you understand the project before it starts so you know what you're getting before you pay for it. And we've answered all the questions that the home homeowner, the contractor might have glazed over, or the um, contract doesn't specifically spell out, or the legal documents don't answer because your contractor is giving you a bad quote or a bad contract or bad information. I'd like to answer more questions. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you guys very much. Yeah, can I do your first <laughs> Okay, is this I'll just yell as soon as I Okay. Yeah. I've got your presentation here if you just wanna um... Oh, is that me? Well no, it'll be you. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're just talking about right, should I just like signal? Bit. Yeah, you can just okay. glance over. All right, I'm can see. I just not can I just yell at you guys? I feel like I've been this the whole yeah. time. Okay, great. Thank you. He's going to be able to hear you, so yell loudly. To start waving if you can't understand what I'm saying. Um, Maybe? No, this is not me. I thought I was born. This is not me. Oh, sorry. I thought it was number four. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So this is, I don't need it. That's all. Okay, this is Melanie of um, Fit Study. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, okay, so my name is Melanie Weinberger. I'm the founder of Fit Study, and we make it easy for companies to have on site wellness. So before I go to the next slide, I want to ask everyone here. What wellness is? Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you. What is, what is wellness? Wellness is uh, programs for your employees that you can uh, uh, optimally perform it. Uh, Who else knows what it is? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was a great answer. Okay, so the answer is that there's actually a lot of answers to wellness. Like I bet you what everyone were to tell me if I called it all of you would be correct. And that's actually very, very confusing. So if you know that wellness is physical fitness or it's eating better or it's feeling better or I don't know how many things it is, what's right for my company, that's a really hard question to answer. Now imagine it's your job to answer that question. So I sit down with HR professionals and VPs of HR probably every other day, sometimes three a day, whatever, that's a great day, that's the day. Um, and they have some of the most complicated job descriptions I've ever seen in my life. They are responsible for wellness, but that's actually at the bottom of their list. The first thing they have to do is make sure that they have the right talent and the right seats and their jobs done well, which requires recruitment, vetting hundreds of applications, training people, getting their desks set up, making sure the politics aren't messing up the whole company, dealing with health benefits, dealing with legal things. It's really big, and they're really stressed out. That is, they're actually one of uh, the companies I work with, Spreadfast. These women are responsible for one of the fastest growing technology companies in downtown Austin. And they have to check out the wellness box, but guess what? They're not sure what the answer to wellness is. They're not doctors, they're not personal trainers, they're not nutritionists, and they're not sure what to do. And no one is actually really making it simple for them to answer that question right now. There's kind of like two really big buckets of solutions. The first are like giant uh, legacy health insurance companies that build out a product to solve that need because people ask them for it, so like, hey, there's some money there. So imagine Blue Cross Blue Shield tells you, for 20 grand, you can have a portal where your people can log in and read about broccoli. And how many people are logging in and reading about broccoli? Not that many people. Going in and entering data makes you really good at data entry. It doesn't make you really healthy. On the other side of the spectrum, when they try and figure out, like, okay, that no one's really engaging in that, how do I bring in activities, they're, they'll call up local studios, like a yoga studio, who's gonna tell you yoga is probably the answer to your wellness question. <laughs> or they're gonna call up Massage Envy and see if they do corporate massage. And so they're making like eight different phone calls a day and they're just <clears throat> trying to see if they can get someone to come on site, not really sure if that's the right investment for them to make. So what we do is we make it easy. We make it easy to understand, we make it easy to solve, and we make it easy to measure if it's working or not. Um, the way we do that is by helping them define what wellness means for their company. So I'm actually gonna ask everyone to stand up. Is that weird? Could you do it? Can you all stand up? Just reach for the sky as high as you can. Higher, higher. Feel that? Feel your sides? Ah, that's real. That's real activity. You can sit now. Thank you so much. So we bring real activities to your company because wellness is really getting your butt up off of your seat. It's not entering your weight into calorie counters. That's good, awareness is good, but movement is better. So we aggregate wellness professionals and communities and take that power and channel it into companies and focus it on the problems that they really have. We run a survey up front that lets us show companies where the challenges really lie. We bring in the professionals who can solve the problem. We build a software platform that measures the efficacy of every activity so we can show the lift and perceived wellness of every individual who participates. We're showing things like 80% stress relief in companies like Spreadfast, Accruent, and Build Aside. Um, we have six companies on our roster right now. We've raised a seed round, a small one. Um, one of our investors is the ad agency I worked for before I left. And the other is Dan Graham from Build a Sign, who was a client before he invested. Um, and we are looking for uh, science-minded data engineers, or engineers who are data-minded, um, want to deal with big data sets and help us figure out what are the right metrics to measure and help us build a platform that's going to scale it. We validated the shit out of it, and now it's go time. <laughs> that's it. Questions? You can go to the last slide. Uh, that's not the right phone number, so just get at me if you want to phone. Yes. What's your background? Uh, I was in advertising marketing strategy for nine years, and then I was also a personal trainer. And I've been working on this for two years. We're already making money. Um, so we, right now, kind of take a cut between the two parties. There's actually a lot of revenue streams that we can go after. Um, so we're working on a couple of different strategies, but we're trying to be really, really focused on the core product before going over the place. Is that a question? Yes. 
question. It's like a marketplace, for, so we take a cut of your tool. So you mentioned an 80% stress relief in your three customers. How do you measure that? Surveys. So like before and after, immediate before and after. So with their, uh, every professional can log in our app and they see the activities that are assigned to them for that week. <clears throat> and then they can take attendance. There's an active survey that people answer. And so we collect all the data and we deliver a monthly report to every company. So it's your perceived state of wellness in the app. So it seems like you have a good product and some good traction behind you. But what are the biggest challenges as you scale this up? The biggest challenge is as we scale it up. So there's a, a dance you have to play between how many wellness professionals you recruit and how many jobs are available. If you recruit too fast and then you try and call people to give them a job, they forget that they're part of the network. And they like uh, so the wellness industry is very, very, very fickle when you are an independent uh, wellness professional. And that's part of one side of our marketplace that we're helping solve. We're helping create really great jobs for these people. A lot of times trainers go into real estate or become teachers or nutritionists do the same thing because it's really hard to keep steady revenue flow. Um, so I'd say that's one of the challenges. Um, and then just figuring out what's the, what's the model scale to each city, like what's the cost of inventory, like you could think about all these long posts in inventory. So how much advertising do we have to do to ramp up each city before we can go in and sell? Um, I kind of know the answer to that, but there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> yeah. So how are you measuring the long-term benefits that is a great question. So what's interesting is that Could you repeat the great question. The great question is how are we measuring the long term effect uh, of these services? So like things like productivity or lowering absenteeism. That one's easy. Um, so the way we're looking at it right now is we measure like the immediate perceived impact, which we call sort of a micro measurement, and then there's a macro measurement which a health insurance company would tell you is biometrics like your BMI or your weight or your blood pressure. Um, we're working on that. It's kind of tricky because we need to be HIPAA compliant and we're not there yet. Um, but also, so this is what is interesting, our early adopter doesn't really, they're not asking for that yet. They're bringing these on as perks. It's like your venture back tech companies who are all fighting for engineer talent and need to have a ping pong table. That's who the first buyers are. We have two companies right now who are asking how to map it back to productivity and we're working with them to build a solution with them. So self-reported data, like surveys on how happy are you, is this work that? If you want to help me solve it, we should talk about it after this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, next up is Tron with FitChip. And I think this will work. Hi, my name is Trump with uh, FitShip. Um, now that you guys know about wellness, I'm going to take a spectrum of that um, towards fitness, and specifically fitness in the office. Uh, sorry, that also So, how many of you are sitting right now? With all raise your hand. Sitting for a prolonged time increases the risk of chronic diseases. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna. So, sorry, I'm trying to mess with this here. So, the more you sit, essentially, the employees are increasing their, reducing their health and going up in, sorry, I'm totally pulling this. <laughs> That's why I was talking about. So the more you sit, the poorer your health is, the earlier you may die, no matter how fit you are. Um, Experts label this as modern day health epidemic, sitting disease. For us, we're gonna focus on sitting in the office. Your body is designed to move. It shuts down at a metabolic level, using less blood sugar, burning less fat, and increasing your risk of heart disease. But it's not just about dying earlier. It's also about the chronic pain, uh, neck pain, back pain, arm pain, and all that's a result of sitting in the office um, seven, eight hours a day. On top of that, you're commuting, you're sitting behind the wheel, and you're going home and stuck behind a TV, for example, for another two hours. And all that's costing employees $1,700, I mean, employers $1,700 per year per employee. Um, purely on lost productivity costs that's cited by the CDC. Oh, sorry. So let's can we go to the next one. So 
So FitShare is a wellness solution for the workplace that engages employees in short two to five minute workouts without changing your clothes. So what you're seeing here is kind of like a micro gym. It includes a stability ball, light resistance weights, and you kind of walk up to a station, don't you break, knock out a two to five minute workout, whether it's stretches, uh, high intensity three minute workout, or even um, workouts to fix your back pain. We have workouts designed by a physical therapist. So um, you can walk to the station and follow just four minute workout, two minute, without having to worry about what to do. It's fully trackable. So we deploy that data and it's available to HR um, employers. And uh, so here's a, here's a quick example of our um, current happy clients. Over here, you kind of see Sandra. She's a little bit older. She had previous back pain, but now she's um, able to do a five minute stronger back exercise while at work, um, where normally she wouldn't even walk into the gym. And now she feels better, she's walking, she's happier, she's more productive. Um, and over here, you have a spectrum of Casey or Tiffany, they're a little younger, they do CrossFit. She's a mom, she might not have time. She might not have time to commit to a 30 to 60 minute workout um, outside the office. So now she just knocked out three, five minute sessions at work. We also gamify this, adding elements of, adding elements of uh, badges, leaderboards, uh, just kind of engage the user while they're in the office. So, in summary, what we're seeing here is employers are getting sick because they're sitting a lot. Even if you run that 30 minutes outside the office, you're still at risk for chronic diseases, chronic pain. And if you just Google sitting, sitting, smoking, or sitting disease, you're going to find a lot of information on that. Um, and here's just kind of a way of how to integrate it throughout your work day by taking a four minute, two minute, or five minute stretch, back pain workout. Um, or a high intensity um, way to charge up your mind without dumping any spilled coffee. Um, so right now, we are a team of three. We have a sales co-founder, a uh, physical therapist. Uh, we're looking for more help with sales as well as community management. Yeah. All right, awesome. <laughs> Questions? Can you talk about some of your Customers that you have today? Sure. Anything, from, anything in particular? Who's trying it out? And and you know, are they? What do they think of it? Sure. Yeah. So our customer Oppenheimer, um, they're a group of about 30 to 50 year olds. Uh, prior prior to us coming in, they had the boss doing workouts in his cold store once a day. Um, now we have 60 percent of the employees there doing workouts in the office. Um, and they're really enjoying it. We get the feedback is uh, really good because we're essentially creating an internal trigger. So if you're frustrated or you have back pain from sitting, uh, rather than walking to uh, water cooler or something, you can go get a quick workout. Do you sell these products to the businesses or do they license them into their actual offices? Right, so it's, uh, it's kind of like a lease model and it's also a SaaS solution, so we charge per month um, by their employee. Per employee. Yeah. That's a good question. So it's it's catered to based on different levels that anyone can participate, uh, whether you're a beginner or you're an expert. We also have a 24-7 email support direct to our um, master trainer, and he can write you a custom workout. So if you look at Sandra earlier, we discovered that she had back pain, and we created a custom workout, and now she's consistently doing it once a day. Is yes. that custom workout cost money? No, it is part of our solution cost at this time. It is a valid service, um, but at this point we, we are able to keep up with demand. And this isn't available um, to consumer download at the moment. We're only specifically targeting uh, corporations. Yes? So uh, your back is going through pain, and you're this product, you get up, you do an exercise, and it gets worse. Is there like a release of liability that you guys have? Yes. How do you deal with that? Yeah, we have a TOS agreement and we work with the company to approve that. And you work with HR departments to? <clears throat> yes. So mostly we target HR. Yeah. All right.
Great. Thank you very much. I need to learn your technique of getting this started back up. Shall Thanks. Your face. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tron. Next up is Claire Bo with Neon Facet. <clears throat> It's actually my it's turn. Actually your turn. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Can work just get your face with this. <laughs> Somebody in the first row? Yeah. Okay. So I'm Claire. I am the founder of Neon Bassett. It's a platform to um, display the authentic customer content of your products. So a little bit about me and why I started Neon Bassett. So, uh, doesn't look as pretty as it used to, but that's okay. Um, so I'm the founder of Neon Facet. I've been working on it since about July of the middle of last year. It's a pivot from my previous startup, um, Pretty HQ, which was a peer-to-peer -peer beauty market or beauty review site. So, um, and then before that, I was working at a, a couple different startups and companies, but most notably Electronic Arts and Build Design. So, all I kind of want to tell you about myself is that I have a pretty broad experience across social. Um, big consumer brands and e-commerce, and that's how I came to Neon Facet. So what is Neon Facet? It's a platform for brands and retailers to collect, curate, and display the user-generated content around their products. So what you would do if you were a brand, uh, say J.Crew, you would give us your catalog of products, and we would go out and find all the user-generated content at the product level, so we can actually get down to the SKU level of products. So we look across all channels, all hashtags, we cut through all the noise, the millions of photos on Instagram, the hours and hours of content on YouTube, and we find content at the specific product level. So this example is Hunter Boots, Rain Boots, it's pretty good for this cold weather that we've had. And so we found all of the Instagrams, um, to, uh, YouTubes and Tumblrs of the black Hunter Boot. And then what a brand can do once they're in our platform is approve and reject the content that matches their brand. So um, user-generated content is great. It's really authentic. Some of it is horrible. Um, I've seen it. And so as a brand owner, you really want control over what user-generated content you display and what you don't. And our platform lets easy one-click approval of content, which then gets pulled into uh, many different kinds of integrations. So we have everything from a two-line JavaScript widget, uh, multiple styles, to an API integration. So you can do all sorts of custom integrations across your own properties. And what this helps brands do is essentially increase conversion rate and engagement. So when you're shopping um, for an item of clothing or a product, um, just like reviews, this gives you the social proof you need to be sure of your door purchase and helps um, brands sell more. So where are we? Um, the V1 product is live, so you can aggregate, curate, display, and report on content across these three main channels, Instagram, YouTube, and Tumblr. Um, about to close our first paying, so paying clients, and prove out the ROI with our first pilots. So those will be going live in the next weeks to months. And then um, my goal, and while I'm here, is to find a technical or sales co-founder to help scale either the technical infrastructure or the sales. So I've done it end to end. I built the product from the ground up, and I've been doing sales all myself, which is very exciting, but um, it's more work for one than for one person. So I'm really looking for either technical expertise to help me scale um, some of the back-end stuff or somebody that has really good contacts in um, brands, retailers, and e-commerce sites that can help me with sales. And then once we've proven the ability to scale and our traction, looking at raising funds to move forward. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's um, that's an option. Yeah, so he's asking if I'm looking to partner with e-commerce platforms to have this as an integrated part of their platform. Yes, um, I think that will be a um, longer term acquisition channel for us is doing those partnerships, but right now because the product's really on, really focusing on direct sales. Yep. How do you deal with the so that's a good question. We access everything through the publicly available APIs of, um, of these channels. And so we're accessing and displaying everything within the terms of service. Now, we do have an extra layer of approval that we offer brands. Where basically, when you approve, we can shoot you, say, an Instagram message and say, hey, we're Hunter Boot. We love this photo, this Instagram. Hashtag us back at Hunter Approval, and we'll get you live on our site. So there is some level of um, 
kind of user acceptance that we can build in. And then we also have kind of automated reporting. So if you go on a website and you see your photo and want to report it, we will just pull that automatically. Who are your biggest competitors? Um, so there are a couple competitors out there doing very similar things. There's one called Olapic. Um, they're very specifically focused on Instagram. Um, where I see us differentiate ourselves long term is not on the aggregation and display piece, which I think is actually pretty easy to do. You know, publicly available APIs for channels. Where I really want to focus on is building out expertise and mechanisms by which you get your customers to share this content. So really being experts in creating feedback loops of when you purchase, how do you get somebody to share an Instagram or share a photo on their site? Um, when somebody shares a photo, how do you reward them so that photo goes further in social channels? So there are competitors, but we're really differentiating on a different aspect of the business. Any other questions? Have you contacted a big commerce or illusion? Because I think you might already be at a point where they'd be happy with you. Yeah, so. Yeah, so yes, and um, it's a matter of doing the technical integration. So right now, this is a standalone platform that works. If anybody hears from Big Commerce or Revolution and wants to talk to me, that's great too. Um, but it's a matter of like, where do I spend my limited technical um, resources to do the API integrations? I absolutely think it's something worth it. Um, the other challenge is finding the right types of clients. So a lot of times with big commerce of illusion, you're actually not going to see the content out there that a bigger brand would see. So it's less value for kind of do-it-yourself um, e-commerce merchants. Although on the on the higher end, there's a lot of content. Yes. What technology is So the um, site is built on Python. Um, so it does. Uh, it's all built on Python Django. It does API integrations um, from Instagram, YouTube, and Tumblr. We have some technical challenges that we need to solve. So scaling the API calls, we're using um, asynchronous workers to bring that content in right now so we don't run into rate limits. But it's a lot of content. And um, figuring out a way to do that um, aggregation efficiently. And then also on the front end, our JavaScript widgets and our APIs um, could do some performance tuning. So and, yeah. So um, we don't do it. So one of the ways that we um, kind of beat our competitors in the space is we don't actually um, have brands rely on an individual hashtag. Um, I've built an algorithm that goes out and kind of crawls all brand related content and all tag content and really try to pinpoint, well, what would my customer call this product? Do they mention the color? And then try to do best matching and it's actually gotten pretty accurate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Six down. We've got three more presentations left. Um, next up is Armando from ShopScan. Hey, guys. I'm Armando Rivera. I'm a senior at UT Austin, and I'm passionate about, about startups and innovation. And I'm here tonight as the founder of ShopScan. So ShopScan is an app concept that simplifies the grocery shopping experience by empowering, by empowering consumers to find, get, and pay for items using their smartphones. And it's the result of a familiar situation. So a few weeks ago at a grocery store, I was looking for five items, and I only found two of them. Uh, I had to run to the checkout link, but they were all jam-packed, and half of them were closed. I was late for a meeting. I was really frustrated that I didn't find those three items I needed. And I was just really at a piece with the whole situation. It was a joke. Um, now, this situation is quite familiar in many places. And the reason is consumers shop primarily on price. They're usually, uh, they're usually in the store for, they're in a hurry. And they want to capture as much value as possible. And similarly, stores and brands are competing on fluctuating prices. And they're trying to capture as much value from changing demographics. So for this problem, how do you? Maximize the shopping experience, shopping experience for the consumer and the seller. And it turns out we're looking at a huge market. Um, uh, the, Amer the American grocery industry represents roughly half a trillion dollars in annual revenue. And it's steadily growing, it's generally non cyclical, and it's a primarily universal model around the world. Um, now that people have more opportunities to be flexible with their time and activities, Tasks like grocery shopping during the busiest times have become much more frustrating. frustrating. 
And similar examples of problems like the one I faced aggregated into the like massive scheme of this huge industry translate into major constraints for stores, brands, and consumers. Now, our ShopScan solution will provide users with a val valuable integrated platform that delivers a simplified and satisfactory experience. Cool features such as shopping list automation, in-store GPS navigation, personalized promotion, barcode scanning, checkout options, and a simple payment feature, feature will form the foundation of a highly personalized consumer-centric product. Our goal is to build a platform that combines and integrates all the standard features that our competitors, direct and indirect, already employ, and to elevate their value and function. And we'll create value by increasing the level of consumer engagement between stores and brands. Now, as far as the market segment, the market segment goes, we're at a pretty early stage right now, and there is a lot of major growth potential over the next years as smartphone, smartphone penetration rates deepen and as mobile technology rates increase. So our business model can start in two ways and then further evolve. We can partner with grocery stores by providing them a solution that helps them increase efficiency and turnover while cutting costs. Um, we'll take a small percentage on every transaction that we facilitate and keep in mind that as the consumer adoption rates and the transactions increase, we will be generating more revenue. We can also partner with brands and offer them a subscription-based service where we give them a dashboard that helps them sell more products by helping them discover new markets and targeting to new people. We can also take a percentage on every successful uh, conversion that we facilitate for them. So there are also premium offerings for consumers, academia, and governments. Uh, and really this platform is much more than just facilitating shopping. It's an opportunity to enter a whole new world of big data for personalized consumer, uh, personalized consumer data. Next slide. Um, so how will we become a billion dollar company? Should you say so to address that? Um, well, we'll transform the grocery shopping experience from time consuming and pricey to simple and engaging by providing a whole new level of consumer value. Um, right now we're entering a new era of, in, which, in which the next wave of mobile technology will drastically revolutionize the playing field. And not only that, but also transform the ways in which human beings lead their lives. So right now, I'm looking for a technical co-founder and potentially a full team and investors to help me make this happen. And the idea is to build an MVP here in Austin, test locally, develop partnerships with the local leaders, and to take this to the US and globally, perhaps. Um, with ShopScan, we will be the future of grocery shopping, and I believe that that's just the beginning. So, thank you. And as a side note, um, the domain is the change, so it's myshopscan.com now. So, you want to email. So, it sounds like your MVP is going to be an application based MVP for like a mobile app. So, how are you going to focus on protecting people's like financial interests as they enter their credit card numbers and pay via app, especially as a startup company? Right. So, um, the MVP actually wouldn't be the actual app. It would be more like a splash page to gather a lot of uh, consumer interest in the app. But in terms of security, we would put a lot of emphasis on that. We start by using PayPal um, and integrating that. The idea is to use existing technology. There are a lot of APIs that actually link us to the inventories of all the systems across the country. It's actually very easy to build the MVP. I just need someone who knows how to do it. Um, and then based on that, we can say, well, why don't we just build this from the ground up? And the payments function could be a business in itself. Or, you know, we're saving the stores those transaction fees and we're taking them in ourselves. So security is a big concern, but we focus a lot on that. Yeah. Have you approached other have you approached Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a friend who has very close ties to the HEB Empire. I pitched this to her and she loves the idea. Uh, she's already setting me up with some of the upper ups in the company. And she did, you know, point out some things that she's kind of skeptical about, but she thinks it would really disrupt the ways that brands engage with each other. She says that, you know, like brands spend a lot of money to try to get their products at eye level. And developing a product that will essentially, you know, make that irrelevant will be very disruptive to the whole industry. It will change the dynamics that brands employ to, you know, promote their items. So. Yeah, I mean, and we do have some uh, some competitors up north 
It's not really that big right now, but they're partnering primarily with the stores, like uh, Shop and Go and, and whatnot. And the, the research, the results from those stores is that the consumers love it. And people who use those apps have increased their shopping and they shop more often at the store. So, they like that. Yes? Why would they want to use you, like HEB, instead of setting up their own? And how do you still deal with the issue of delivery of the product? which is a big expense in any type of uh, online market. Right, so um, that's a concern. Uh, why would they want to choose us? The vision is to make this an integrated platform where we have direct ties to all the brands and we're incentivizing users to use this app with their stores. So um, the idea is to have essentially like a wallet of any superstore, any grocery store that you would shop at and not have to like download an app for HEB, an app for Whole Foods, an app for whatever store. That's the issue right now. Our main competitor does that. They will develop an app for HEB, and you have to use only their HEB app. Um, we make it easy for you to have all your apps in that single platform, and we make it easy for a lot of, a lot of other product offerings that are coming later version. So does that allow people to shop, compare, what's the price of Absolutely. HEB and Whole Foods, and who do they want to order from? Absolutely. This was a four minute pitch. The 15 minute pitch was more going to more detail. How, how do you deal with the, the costs of delivering product? The costs of delivering? Yeah, there have been numerous online marketing of products, and, and the one problem with groceries has been the cost of actually delivering the, uh, the groceries. And you mean delivering? To the consumer. To the consumer? Well, one of the key points of, of the vision is to really push personalized promotion. And that's where we're gonna kind of unleash brand wars. Uh, by gathering a lot of data on each individual, we're gonna get to have a very good idea of who you are, what you want, what you wanna buy, and what they should be promoting to you. So let's say that you're at HEB or some store and that you know, you're, we, we know from your social media profiles and any, anything we skim from that you're interested in being healthier and fitter. Um, Shobani Yogurt, we can send the data to Shobani and say, if this is a perfect candidate, you can convert and make him a customer. Um, you know, they can send you promotion on the spot and then with other features we can say, we hundreds of your friends love this product and they've used it before. So I mean, there are many different avenues that we can explore to get them to buy more products and to push this product to the actual market. It would be free and we'd be like tapping into the food blogging community. Are you planning to deliver the product to the home or is this still something where uh, oh, we're not in, helping them? We're not in the grocery delivery business. Ah, okay. This is simply a shopping aid in store and there's been a very big rise for these technologies that aren't really being developed. Um, yeah. Question? Sorry. All right, let's wrap it up. We can see him in the lobby afterwards. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, we've just got three more presentations left. Um, next up is Split i5. Ben? Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Okay, it doesn't look like Ben's here. So let's go to Vantage Skyler. True apps? Vantage. Okay, so as of today, uh, 2014, there are six major corporations that control 95% of all media that you see in the United States. Uh, and advantage that makes us really uncomfortable. Um, there's a couple more. So what we're trying to do, or what we're building right now, is something that will take away uh, agenda, uh, bias, spin, um, all those things from the news business. Um, if you think about six corporations controlling the media, and if you were to break that down into you know, the C-suite executives, there might be more people in this room right now than that really control the agenda of media in the United States, and that's ridiculous. Um, so what we're creating is a, a platform. Uh, so what is it? It's an app, it's a mobile app, it's a web app, 
it's a streaming channel for um, Google TV, Apple TV, uh, Smart TV. Essentially what we're creating is a replacement for the five o'clock news. So um, what you'll, when you open Vantage on your smartphone, on your computer, wherever you're seeing Vantage, uh, it's going to show you what's important to you. And not what we decide is important to you, what the people decide uh, is important. So it's using metrics, it's using an algorithm, it's always uh, seeing what is uh, happening all the time to decide what is uh, the important sort of uh, new speed. So the idea is that people my age, people our age, uh, we don't watch the five o'clock news anymore. Uh, so this is a replacement for it. So if you're in Austin and you're watching the five o'clock news, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see, you will see a couple of uh, local stories, but chances are better than not, the, the two top stories, or maybe more than that, uh, are gonna be you know, international or, or global stories. And the scope of Vantage is gonna be similar to that, except that the uh, journalist on Vantage is everyone. It's you. It's everybody with a smartphone, so. Uh, okay, so when something really important happens in the world, and you know, unfortunately sometimes, as far as news goes, that's a tragedy. Um, you know, who's there on scene first? Well, it used to be 20 years ago, in order to be a journalist, in order to report on something, you needed a news van, you needed uh, equipment, you needed somebody to hold a boom mic, you needed uh, uh, thousands of dollars worth of you know, camera equipment. Nowadays, everybody has uh, more equipment than that in their pocket right now, it's called a smartphone. So the idea is that who, who's gonna be on scene first for any given you know, event, whatever is happening, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, even in the, uh, in the instance where you know, the Boston Marathon, there was some media coverage there, uh, there's still gonna be, whoever, whoever's gonna be on scene first is not gonna be that news van full of reporters, it's gonna be you, it's gonna be somebody, it's gonna be somebody with a smartphone. So we're creating a, a platform that everybody can be a journalist and not only uh, are we changing the way that consumers will get the news, but we're creating an economy where a journalist can uh, get paid for that content too. So because uh, a lot of times there's gonna be uh, the, the, the first content that comes around on any uh, trending topic or important story is gonna be from Vantage, these other news organizations, those six corporations I talked about before, they're gonna have no choice but to, to, to use our stories, to use our content, our videos, and they're gonna, they can purchase it through our system, uh, content licensing model, and that's gonna go on and pay that uh, journalist so that they can continue to you know, follow their own endeavors, so that there's no agenda, so that if you wanna be a journalist, you can look after, you can report what you want, you can investigate what you want, and you know, there's no control from uh, the, the media for that anymore. So, uh, next. <clears throat> There's a couple more. So again, it's, you know, it's a mobile app, it's a web platform. It is, um, the last thing we want to call it is a social network, but at its very, you know, it, the technology is, it, it is a social network, but it is a decentralized news organization. It's peer-to-peer -peer news, it's raw street journalism, uh, and it's, uh, you know, we're going to change the way that the news business runs and we're going to change the news. Great. <clears throat> and if you want to know any more, just uh, talk to me. Is it exclusively video news? No, um, she said, is it exclusively video news? No, there's going to be, you know, images, content. We're going to create a rich uh, set of tools. The idea is that we do want high-end journalism. We want actual stories. Um, you know, it, it, how people end up using this is up to people. You, you can never, you can never tell them how they're going to use it. But um, we do want people to publish actual articles. So there's going to be uh, images, video, and you know, the, the ability to publish actual stories and articles. Have you guys given any thought to how you're going to keep false stories and pictures and so on off your platform? Well, it, it goes against our whole uh, mantra for us to remove anything, but the idea is we're building an algorithm we're calling event scaffolding, which does many different things. And, and uh, really the idea is that if somebody posts, you know, what we don't want, what we're not interested in, is not only false information, but unimportant information. We don't care that you found a taco on sale. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for actual stories. So the idea is that if something either false or 
uninteresting gets posted that it falls off and becomes not part of that mainstream that you see. As it, again, this is a replacement for the five o'clock news. So you, while you can search for all kinds of different stories, there, there's going to be that line of you know the 12 or 15 that are important to you, depending on who you are, where you are, how old you are, what location you're in. Um, you know, and if something's not interesting, hopefully you do not see it, so it doesn't become an issue. Uh, yeah. What are your current needs? What are you looking for? Um, we, I'm really here to get you excited. Uh, we're, 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 we're gonna launch beta in a couple months. Uh, you'll probably hear more, uh, you'll, you will, you'll hear more about us at South by Southwest. Uh, we are still looking for some, uh, pre-VC funding, uh, but we are, uh, you know, we're planned through beta and building it. And, uh, yes, and I would say above anything else, we're looking for, you know, some, some investors. Uh, yeah. Have you heard of it? Dig, yeah. Reddit. Yeah, yeah, Reddit. I mean, Reddit would be the the, the, the text version of this. <laughs> this is much more, you know, visual based. And it, but yeah, I mean, uh, I would say Reddit is the you know the text <laughs> equivalent, uh, sort of in some way. But you know, it's certainly not. Did you say you've heard of Dig? Yeah. Have you read the rise and fall of Dig? Uh, this, uh, I guess you'd have to elaborate for me. You have the outstanding. Watch what Kevin Rosen did. How he did. Especially with the co-founders. Make sure you find real-time right co-founders. How your social uh, aggregated news. They did some things excellent. Real quick. And also, went against what the users wanted. Especially the poor of it. Okay. Because it came to the Okay. Repeat what he said. Uh, he said that I should pay very good attention to what happened to Dig and uh, the, the rise and fall of Dig, which I will take into consideration, certainly did. So, um, yeah. How is this different from Reddit? Reddit does have subreddits for videos and pictures that get extremely, extremely detailed. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and again, I think the biggest difference is if you want to know uh, what the news is. And first of all, I, I didn't even have time to get into the economy of it all. We're building an economy so that freelance journalists can make a living through this. And that is one of the most important things we're doing. And it's based on crowdfunding and content licensing and uh, a few more complicated things that I can't explain in five minutes. But uh, also, the, what we're really trying to do is become a replacement for the five o'clock news. Reddit's messy and awesome, but you can't just look at it and go, oh, that's what's important right now to me. Uh, and, and you know, and based on what, so it's, it's, it's a bit more concise. And, uh, but again, it's about the, the funding models and it's about creating a decentralized news organization. All right, we've got time for one more. Well, uh, I guess in the same way, again, I hate calling it a social network, but uh, you know, Twitter doesn't have to defend itself for what you know Justin Bieber says on there. So we don't, we don't, it's a socially driven content, so we aren't taking credit for it it being, you know, you, we didn't fact check anything. And that's going to be kind of, you know, in the fine print or in the total print. But uh, so I don't want to call it social network, but by the same means, they don't have to, you know, fact check because it is socially built content. Thank you very much. Quick, quick, quick question. Just okay. let me just ask this, because you just said that Reddit was a little bit messy, but then you're saying that you're not going to curate any of the stuff that I sent to you. How does that work? Well. I don't mean that it won't be any less messy on, on the back end, but the visual presentation to you as a viewer, okay. you're going to pick it up and you're going to see, you know, the 20 or 30 most important things right. that are happening at that given second. Uh, and that might be, you know, the biggest news story of the day, uh, the second biggest news story of the day, two things local to Austin, yeah. uh, you know, so it's a replacement for the five o'clock news for you. So red, red is bigger and messier than that. But. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. We've got one more pitch left, and then we're going to fit in a reverse pitch. So we're we're um, we're pretty close to the end. Last is Flexter, Jameson, and team. Hello, my name is Jameson, and we are Flexter. So let's dive in. More than 58 million Americans used health clubs in 2012. 
and only 11% of those 58 million utilized a personal trainer. So you may ask, why such a low percentage? Well, most obvious reason, it's expensive. On average, oh, it costs over $50 an hour to hire these personal trainers. And of 80% of Americans, uh, they can't stand more than three feet away from the phone. So that leads us in. So. so the idea of Flexster is really to create a platform to allow users to explore, build, track, and even share workouts throughout the app. Uh, as you see here, this is kind of a screenshot of some, some of the app and some of the tabs, starting with Explore. On the Explore tab, you can go to the tab, check out, explore workouts from all different kinds, whether they be at home or at the gym itself, ranging from yoga to getting ready for a spring break, work on your abs, things like that. Um, and if you take particular interest in any of the workouts, you can click on it, and that takes you to the next screen, which is the workout preview, which gives you a little more of a uh, description, a detailed description of that workout and some of the exercises that, that will entail in that workout. If you like it, you can either save it for later on your profile or you can go ahead and start it now. And if you start it now, that's going to take you over to your track tab. Your track tab is where you actually go through the workout uh, with video demonstrations for each exercise as well as some trainer notes and text and things like that to kind of get you going through the workout. Uh, what really differentiates us is a, this app allows you to really build a uh, workout seamlessly throughout the app. So fitness enthusiasts and trainers can uh, go on here, build exercises and workouts, and share them with other users. And lastly, of course, you have your profile to add that little personal touch. Um, and, and really, uh, this is another way to explore workouts as well, because you can check out what your friends and favorite celebrities are doing and you know try out the workouts for yourself. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to talk a little bit about our business model. So now imagine you're the client and uh, you're getting ready for a big wedding or beach season is around the corner or just simply you just want to look good naked, which happens. So now you go to a, you go and sign up to a gym and you've read a lot of articles online and you're still not seeing progress so you don't really know what to do. So you do the next logical thing and you hire a personal trainer. Well the problem is with a personal trainer you're literally paying over $50 an hour and the trainer on average makes about 15 So you can see a big portion of that goes to the gym. So we thought why not create a platform that allows you to connect the user to the personal trainer. And in this, the trainer, as John showed, has all the tools to quickly create and share a workout. The trainer can charge anywhere from zero to $10. And every time a workout is bought on the app, the trainer makes 20%. Apple has to keep 30% and our, our app keeps the rest. So in a way, both parties benefit. The, the client has a much cheaper workout. It's a great workout. It has video and text instructions. And as well as the client now has reached the trainers all across the globe all across the globe, not just locally. As well as the trainer, the trainer typically has, on average, at their gym, about 25 clients. So now the trainer has access to all our user base. Their revenue, or the amount of money they make is not really tied up to their time as they have access to all their users. And uh, this supplemental income can really be beneficial as trainers usually face a lot of fluctuations with clients. In addition, trainers can help build their personal brand. Um, they can help, help more people follow and get more clients to their local gym. So we're really creating an app that benefits both parties. I know you're thinking, well, I can afford a personal trainer. Why would I use this app? And the answer is, you're right. You wouldn't. We're not really supplementing per or we're not replacing personal trainers. We're actually giving them a platform to create and share workouts. And I think our platform does just that by allowing the client to connect to the personal trainer. So as of right now, we're three to five weeks away from initial launch. And what we're looking for is an angel investor as well as a technical co-founder that shares our vision and really sees the potential of how big this app could be. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead, work Flexter, and uh, thank you. So you can think of this in a way that it kind of helps the gym, or it could help the gym in a way. So the gym makes goes on the app, makes a profile, 
They make a lot of good workouts. Users like these workouts, so they're more inclined to go to the gym. But not only that, the app could be an avenue for the gym to showcase the ability of their trainers. So while at the same time you're helping trainers, at the same time you can really help the gym by showcasing the gym to the community. Right. So for a lot of the gyms, you'd actually go to the gym and help get all the trainers on board and more of so advertise the gym. But um, the way this could be done is the gym goes on there and makes they make a couple of free workouts or they make a couple of small paid workouts, almost like a bait and hook. So these are really great workouts. The users want to go to the local gym and train with these trainers. But another avenue is not just for trainers, but for users that are expertise that don't have time to get their personal training license or go through a certification program, but actually know a good amount of info. They go on this site, they create profiles, and they can you know, take me to the gym to train with them. They're not actually trainers at the gym, but they're people that have fitness experience that want to help me out and at the same time make some uh, side revenue. Uh, how do you differentiate between the free content that's available out there and specifically like a fitocracy where I can follow a very famous personal trainer and copy their workouts every day for free? Um, what's the differentiation that makes me want to pay two to ten dollars for a workout? And then how is that time investment worth it on the trainer's side? No, that's a, that's a really good question. So. A trainer can go on and make a free workout with the idea that I'm going to make a good free workout so people follow me and I get more users and next time I actually charge for a workout, I will have a bigger user base or more people to advertise to. So the idea is people that are naturally making paid workouts, that should be better content, but if it's not, there are rating systems in place and the way people like it or comment on it and the algorithm algorithms favor so that great content or content that is liked is actually shown on Explore. So if someone could easily make a really bad paid workout and one person might buy it, comment negatively or two people might buy it, and you know, you never really see it throughout the app. I mean, that's just something you need to face. Next question. Oh, yes, please. So the beauty of it is anyone can build a workout by just building any exercise, combining these exercises together, providing video and text instructions. So we're not just going for people that go to gyms. It could just as well be a home workout. It could be a seven minute workout, it could be a five minute workout, it could be a very easy wellness workout, it could be it could be anything really. So there's workouts that have various degree of difficulties. It could be very easy, it could be very hard. So it really it depends on where you fall in the spectrum, but there'd be a workout available for you that you would like that you could do at home or at the gym. Right, right. Okay. I was just curious, yeah. that's, that's required to connect with a fitness three generator. Any other questions? Okay, sweet. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for tonight. I said that we were gonna have a reverse, a reverse pitch, but um, I think we're gonna have to skip that one tonight. Um, Harmon, I don't know if you wanted to speak. We, we have a uh, guest, good guest speaker. Okay, what's your name? Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Hi. Jeremy. So I just really wanna quickly let everybody know a Texas Bitcoin conference is coming up. There's cards on all of the tables. If you're interested in Bitcoin, please go check out the website. Um, we're gonna have a hackathon with a million dollars in prizes. We're gonna have a car show with the guy that bought the first Lamborghini with all Bitcoin or something like that. And uh, uh, parties and all kinds of good stuff that come with the conference. So thank you very much. Okay, an in the interest of uh, a dynamic environment, who would be interested in hearing that last reverse pitch? Okay, reverse pitch is when somebody tries to sell themselves to you with, with the skills that they have or whatever you might need. So let's go ahead and have it. Who was the gentleman that came up? There you are. You want to just quickly do a, a 60 second pitch? No pressure. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Mike Mayhass. Um, I worked as a quant in New York City, which is somebody who predicts stock prices. So very good in mathematics, especially prediction and statistics, very good at high performance computation. So we were predicting uh, 600 stocks, uh, all the S&P 500 and 100 more and making predictions within six milliseconds. So very high speed computation, large scale distributed systems. So those are my expertises. Expertise? Um, <laughs> apparently not English. Uh, but yeah, so I'm looking for a job. I'm here in Austin, and I have enough funding for myself for another year if like a startup opportunity shows up and I need to co-founder. Right. There's a question. Um, I can do just about anything, um, more the back end, like my knowledge is C++, I don't know anything in mobile, I have worked at OkCupid, if anybody wants to do an online dating startup, I can give you a hundred <laughs> ideas, and the, the companies out there are not very good, um, that's pretty honest, um, yeah, I guess those are, like, from employee number two doing anything, so, yes? Uh, big data analytics, um, like I can do computation with linear algebra and like I've worked with large data sets, Gigabyte Plus, but yeah. then that's a longer answer and many more back and forth and I think this audience is, I, I understand some, part, some parts of it, so. Um, do you have an email address? Sure, it's mike at nahas.com. Uh, yes, sure, I can give out cards and all that. Um, and thank you very much. Thank all right. You. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for coming. We're going to ask that you would please take your um, your empty bottles and plates and throw them in the trash for us. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Stay in